Hello everybody, this is your friend George Barlow again, giving you a talk with no audience. So that's always a little disquieting, but we'll see how it goes today. Several weeks ago, Jeannie asked me if I would give a talk on the Ice Age in, in Ohio for Active Aging Week. And uh, so this is that talk. Uh, there have been multiple glaciations of our planet Earth over a very, very long history. And most of these great continental glaciers occurred long before there were human beings around to witness them. Nevertheless, those glaciers have left a, an indelible inscription on the earth and today's geologists can read and interpret those inscriptions and give us a an indication of what the glacier world was like all those years ago presently here in north america and specifically right here in at least two-thirds of ohio we are only about 12,000 to 14,000 years out of the last great continental glacier. I keep using that term continental glacier. What do I mean by that? Well, in the long geologic history of our Earth, there have been a series of glaciers which have covered large parts of North America and certainly a large portion of Ohio. These glaciers have been so large that geologists call them continental glaciers or continental ice sheets. So while a number of these glaciers have covered Ohio over hundreds of thousands of years, they didn't originate in Ohio. Rather, they came into being in far northern Canada, directly north of us, way up in the province of Quebec. It's known that the last glacier which covered Ohio was at its origin, which would have been northern Quebec, as I said, probably anywhere between one and two miles thick. And that's a mind-boggling concept. We can't hardly imagine an ice sheet that would be so thick. It's almost incomprehensible. The next slide, um, gives you an idea of the approximate shape and size of that glacier as compared to the North American continent. You notice that the bottom portion of it, the southern portion, is quite ragged. A number of lobes and indentations, and these lobes represented large extrusions of the glacier to some point. And Ohio is under that lobe on the right hand side, that big one, it's under that lobe, and that lobe covered about two thirds of Ohio. And we'll look at the details of that. What happens is that in the far northern reaches of the province of Quebec, which we call the province of Quebec, but in northern Canada, in ancient times, the earth got colder and it began to snow, not just in the winter but all year round. And as the snow piled up inch after inch and foot after foot, up to 800, 1,000, even 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet in thickness, this monstrosity of ice and snow at some point began to move. Now, it didn't really move on its own. There was nothing that shoved it to move. It was rather that the bottom layer of ice in the glacier under the tremendous weight of all the ice above sort of liquefied not really as water specifically but as kind of a, a mushy sort of material and with that in combination with the tremendous weight on the glacier it began to slide south it couldn't really go north so it began to move and as it moved, it had an enormous effect on the topography of the land that it crossed. <clears throat> By topography, I mean the shape, 
and the features of the land surface. These glaciers have had an anatomy. Typically, their bottoms became sort of this plastic kind of material, something between ice and slush and snow that allowed this immense thing to begin to move. And there would be hardly anything that could stand against it. However, there were some impediments along the way. The next slide shows the same kind of information, but this is as though you were up above the North Pole and looking down, and the light blue is that Wisconsin glacier. It was called Wisconsin glacier because greatest effects were seen in the what today is the state of Wisconsin. And you can see there's a big lobe over there on the right-hand side where it says the word north, which is North America. That big lobe which juts down into what today is the United States and almost completely covers the state of Ohio. It also covered Illinois, and it also covered uh, Indiana, and on west, and Montana, all the states across the United States, all the way to the state of Washington. But you can see the biggest lobe there is in our area. This is very typical of that glacier. I got a little bit of anatomy in this next slide about glaciers and what glaciers are like and how geologists talk about glaciers. And you can see this, the glacier, as sort of that receding kind of pile of ice that's just melting. It doesn't move backwards, it just melts backwards. So the effect is it does move, but not in the same way that it moved southwards, which actually was the physical displacement of the glacier towards the south. And as it melts, where it says receding glacier, you see there are all kinds of effects left in the land. There are lakes, you notice. There are ponds, and there are puddles, and there are mounds of earth, and they all have names. And I'm just gonna give you just a few of them. We can see there that there are kettles down here in which um, is a depression caused by when a big chunk of ice, unimaginably large, maybe as big as this building, crashed down to the earth, was covered with, with soil and other debris from the glacier, and it sat there for years and years and years, slowly melting. And when it did melt, the thing ground above caved in to form like a pot or like, like a kettle, which in many cases here in Ohio it filled with water. And they're all over eastern Ohio in large numbers. That's a glacial feature. If we continue to look at that, we can see the word terminal moraine up in the right-hand corner of the slide. That represents dirt, gravel, boulders, other glacial debris where the glacier sort of stopped and melted but stayed in place and continued to dump its load of dirt into a large hill, and it produces a terminal moraine. If you go just a little bit north of Columbus and take Route 42 west, you will be up on top of a moraine, and as you drive along, you will eventually come to a place where a road sign says, Glacier Ridge Metro Park. Why do you suppose it's called Glacial Ridge Metro Park because it is the remains of a glacial ridge and it's a park which takes in some of the features of that ancient terminal moraine. They're all over Ohio and I may talk about them one or two times as we go along. Then there are eskers. You can see those, E-S-K-E-R. An esker is a deposit of glacial material in just one spot to give rise to a, a hill which has no explanation. It just appears out of nowhere and it sits there and actually it was a piece of the glacier that dumped an unusually large load in that area. And then there are canes. 
and you can see they're marked there in the left hand side of the figure and that is a region of also depression which might be caused for water to accumulate and give rise to some unexplained pond or some very small lake and all eastern Ohio is covered with these kinds of structures and let's see what else we might pick out there in the we talked about the terminal moraine and we talked about drumlins drumlins are also deposits I guess I didn't talk about them but they are deposits that are teardrop shaped they are high on one end and more streamlined toward their northern end and while there aren't very many of them in Ohio, if you go on the, the throughway in New York State, after you leave Rochester heading for Syracuse, you come to row after row of hills, which are streamlined on one end, tapering down to like a teardrop shape on the other, and those are all drumlins. So glaciers have an anatomy, that's my main point here, and and to study glaciers, one has to know something of that anatomy. Geologic time also is another big feature that is difficult for us to get our minds around. Geologists divide the history of our planet into a number of intervals, that is to say, a number of time intervals, which you learn about if you're taking a beginning course in geology, and the words sound so intimidating. And we're going to be talking about one of those intervals today, which is the Pleistocene, sometimes called popularly as the Ice Age. You probably heard of it that way. A geologist would speak of it as the Pleistocene. And it's defined as the time interval from about two plus million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. So you see, we're talking about nearly two million years of Earth history, and that falls into the so-called Pleistocene as a long period of time. But trust me, there are far periods far longer than that. Geologically speaking, then the Pleistocene is a relatively short period in the Earth's history, and it's characterized by the end of the glaciers which is where we are right now. I know we haven't seen a glacier recently, but they're still up there far, far to the north, and we are in that interval now when we're glacier-free. And it was the interval, that Pleistocene, when modern humans sort of took the stage, so they figure in a little bit to our thinking today also. Now I know that 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, seems like an awful lot of time to us, but on a geological scale, it's almost insignificant. I mean, we're, we are at best think in terms of 100 year intervals. We don't think in terms of 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. It's an extremely difficult concept for us to go get hold of. And we have to study geology quite a while before that sort of dawns on us, the significance of that. Prior to the Pleistocene Ice Age, Ohio was very different than it is today. Prior to the Pleistocene Ice Age, there was no Lake Erie. There was no Ohio River. If you could be transported back in time, to Pleistocene, Ohio, you'd never know the place. It is so completely different than what we see today as we drive around in our cars if you're watching the country. For example, an ancient river, which geologists call the Aragons River, flowed through a wide valley where Lake Erie is today, it wasn't there then, and drained much of northern Ohio. And then there was an enormous river that arose in North Carolina, what today is North Carolina, and flowed north through Virginia and northwest through West Virginia and probably entered Ohio, it's thought, right at the point where uh, 
Portsmouth, Ohio is today. And that was the Tays River. It may ring a bell with some of you. There are communities in Ohio that are called Tays. There are schools that are referred to as the Tays High School. Probably the people who go there have no idea where the name comes from, but it recognizes the fact that there is, there was, an immense river that flowed through there. There was no Ohio River at the time we're talking about. So things have changed, and they've changed in mighty ways, but at a very, very slow pace. I'm not going to talk about all that glacial history. Before the last glacier, it would take us way too far afield, and it would be exhausting to everybody. Rather today, I'm going to talk about the last glacier that covered Ohio, and that glacier is known as the Wisconsin Glacier. <clears throat> it started in Labrador, it moved down over some thousands of years, finally came to an area which would today be our northern boundary of Ohio. And in this map I've got here for you, you can see its progress through thousands of years as it moved across Ohio. The first, I'm going to be looking at these pictures here and trying to read them to you all. At about 24,000 years ago, well, 25,000 years ago, it reached what would be now the shore of Lake Erie. There was no Lake Erie then. Then about 1,000 years later, look where it is, approximately 24,000 years ago. And then about another 1,000 years later, it dips way down. In fact, the bottom of that lobe at 23,000 years, guess what? That's right here in Franklin County. But that's a big dip downward, and you can see it's incompletely registered here, but you get an idea of where the front edge of that glacier was. And then about 21,000 years ago, you can see it farther down. And you'll notice something. It keeps going south, south in the western part of our state, but it seems to be stalled on the eastern side. You notice it up there where the line cuts across, and it's hard for me to read it under these circumstances, but I can't, as a matter of fact, I can't. It cuts across and it stays at that point. And going back to the left side of the figure, you see it go still dipping way down almost down in the far left corner. In fact, it does cross over where Cincinnati is today. What's going on here? Why doesn't the thing go all the way? Why is it shaped in this strange configuration? Why didn't the glacier go all the way? Could there have been something in the way? You bet there was. And what we see here, both in the northern part of it and coming down through the middle and south of where Columbus is today, it ran into highlands. It ran into really the Appalachian Plateau, which is the beginning, of course, of the Appalachian Mountains. And it didn't have enough zip, enough punch, to cross over those barriers. And so you see it shifted to the west, that is to say, to your left. I hope that makes some sense to you folks listening. We know an awful lot about these positions because it's been possible to do radian, radio carbon dating in s sections all through here and they're able to determine the ages of when the glacier front was at that particular location. And clearly, it's not complete but at least you get the idea of it. And as you look at Franklin County, I'm hoping you can all pick that out. This loop, the second loop that we have in the second front feature of the glacier, that represents at about 23,000 years ago where the front edge of that glacier was. Subsequently, the earth started getting warmer and the glacier began to recede. Now when I say it began to recede, I don't mean that it 
physically move backwards as it had physically moved downwards, but rather it melted at its leading edge and melted backwards, and in the process dumped all of its contents, which were immense, almost beyond imagination, boulders and soils and sand and gravel and, and created all kinds of situations like gravel pits. If you've been in a gravel pit, I'll show you one here just in a few moments, or if you've been in a sand pit, you can see what almost seems like a mountain of gravel or sand, and we, of course, mine it for purposes. I remember not too, well, it was about three years ago now, when they were building Riverstone, we used to sit in our apartment early in the morning and watch them at very early in the construction, building the garage, which is under Riverstone. It was a terrible job. It took several months to smash through all the limestone underpinnings of that section. And then once they got that done, they were able to go down to the depth that they needed for a garage to go under Riverstone. And I remember the day when the gravel trucks arrived and they spread about a foot of gravel in that area and leveled it very carefully and compacted it. And then trucks and trucks of sand came in and spread sand. All of that material came from gravel pits and sand pits, all of which was a result of the glacier. So these glacier deposits are enormously important in the construction trades. I'm often asked, uh, were there people around? And the answer is probably not in the early years, which have been some centuries of the glacier, but towards the end, when it began to recede, there's evidence that there were primitive Paleo Indians who'd migrated from the west and settled down on the edges of the glacier, probably in caves, and so they would have seen this thing. And I'll try to give you an idea what that thing looked like in just a while. In fact, we might just go to our next picture. It's the same as the previous one, except now I've got it labeled unglaciated and all the greenish area up there. That was a vegetation map that I'm, I'm adapting to use for this purpose. And that was, would be all the glaciated area. And if you remember what the slide looked like, and maybe I can go back to that there, there. You see the pattern is the same. So that was the extent of the Wisconsin Glacier in Ohio before it began to recede, that is to say, before it began to melt. If you get in your car and drive east out of Columbus on I-70, you can see where the glacier ended. Some years ago, we led a trip. We were gonna to go to the Werther Museum in, in Dover, Ohio, and we chose to go on I-70 to I-71, and then north, getting off somewhere for the Dover Museum. And I alerted people on the bus as we left Columbus, and all the land was flat, to watch the territory and to tell me when they thought there was a change. And after a few miles, everybody started talking. It looked different to them. I said, how does it look different? It's not flat anymore, they said. There are hills, there are jagged hills, there are giant cliffs, there are all kinds of things. I said, that's right. That's because the glacier didn't get here. This stopped it. And that's what you see on these maps. Now, if we go a little bit further, we can get an idea from this painting of post-glacial Ohio, which have been the southern regions. First of all, the animals, the mastodons, which were very common, but there were many other animals too. There were sloths and there were bats and, and mastodons and 
mammoths, red squirrels and voles, all of these have been found, shrews and mice and many more. And of course there were humans at this post-glacial time. So if this could have been a view that you're seeing here that those primitive early Paleo-Indians would look at. And you see the glacier way in the distance, sort of at the end of that pond or that little lake. Here's a glacial pond, the kind we described earlier. And there's the glacier slowly melting back. You can see in this slide the, the prominent mammal of that time. Of course, they're all extinct now, the mastodons, um, which were really wood-living, forest-living mammals, unlike the mammoths, which were typical grazers eating grass. They were very different, very different tooth structure. But the thing about this picture, you see the receding glacier in the background. Of course, you've all been to the Ohio History Center, and if you have, you know, soon you walk into the door and there's a, a mastodon skeleton. That was brought to light in a swamp somewhere between Champaign and Clark counties. I don't know quite where it was, but here it is. And this is not the only one. There are many, many other uh, mastodon skeletons that have been discovered. So they were a prominent landform in, the, in what was developing as a post-glacial period. I couldn't resist. I had to put one more painting in by a Stephen Kirk. It was done in 1992. I just thought it was magnificent. Unfortunately, it's in a fold, so it's got that line down the middle. I never could solve that problem. But anyway, it sort of gives you an idea of the forests that were there, you know, so arctic looking. If you go to up, up northern Canada today, that's what you see. You see spruce and, and fir trees and hemlock and tamaracks and grasses like this. But all of this would change with the warming of Ohio. These are really just relic species and we've got wonderful skeletons of them, but I'm getting away from our main topic. So let's get back to glaciers. <clears throat> you might get the idea then that glaciers move, and of course that's right, but they did, and yet they didn't. They did not, they didn't physically move back, they melted back. And in melting back, they dropped whatever was in them, and what was in them was unbelievable. Enormous amounts of material, enough sand to make a whole sand dune area, enough gravel to make today's gravel pit that could be mined for years. We can't even imagine of the transportation of so much material uh, today. <clears throat> so these glaciers moved, and as they moved, they plowed and gouged the terrain under them. But they were not moving on their own. They were being always forced by an enormous pressure from up in Upper Canada, which piles of ice and snow a mile and two mile thick. I guess using the word move is, is a poor word to use. It's sort of a gravity-induced movement, but I can't think of a good word to say it. What I'm going to try and do is to go to a different kind of glacier and see if we can look at it, and this next slide shows it, this is an alpine glacier. There are two kinds of glaciers. There are alpine glaciers and there are continental glaciers. Continental glaciers are the ones that have covered North America for millions of years back in the glacier ages. An alpine glacier, you can see an alpine glacier today. Lots of us do. If you go and take a tour in the inland passageway in Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. This is what you see. This is an alpine glacier. It's a combination of various valley glaciers that come to merge together. And if you look at the top on the right-hand side of the glacier, you can see there's a wing of it that disappears behind those mountains. And there's another wing that seems to be the main one off to the left. And then it flows down and touches the ocean 
And if you're lucky when you're up there, you can watch an iceberg calve, which is always a big thrill to see, because this thing is breaking off on the ocean. That thing is about 200, is about 300 feet tall altogether. The thing is, I should say maybe 300 feet thick, is about 200 feet above the water and about 100 feet under the water. So these things, even these, are immense and the great continental glaciers that occurred in ancient times must have really been awesome to see. I pick another one here. We saw this one from our ship and watched the end. This is the Marjorie Glacier, and you can see how dirty it is on the left-hand side. That's all soil, rocks, boulders, everything scraped away from the valley walls as it moved down the valley. And then the middle is relatively clean. And what I'm going to do is take a picture now from the other side so that you can see what that looks like and see if it's dirty also. There it is. And as you look far to the right, you can see in front of that mountain all the dirt and debris that's in that glacier. <clears throat> so in that sense, we can get the idea of these continental glaciers that covered Ohio as, be, as being very, very dirty. They weren't pretty from the point of view of being pristine snow. They were dirty with the debris <clears throat> of the land, boulders, mud, sand, gravel, all mixed in, which when the glacier melted was just simply dumped. So I asked myself the question, <clears throat> trying to come up with something for you here, what could it have looked like if you had been, you know, one of those early primitive Paleo-Indians? What would it have been like to have lived not far from the glacier? It could have looked like this. Now this is a glacier in Alaska, and there's a boat there. Take that boat out, just imagine that, and think every morning you wake up, that's what you'd look at. Well, you probably wouldn't quite get that close to it because it would be dangerous. But still, it must have been awesome to see something like that. I think very likely that's what the terminal edges of the glacier look like here in Ohio. Now, as the <clears throat> time went on <clears throat> and the earth began to warm again, and we're talking tens of thousands of years, the glacier began to melt and all the stuff in it that had been picked up over hundreds and hundreds of miles was dropped. All the dirt, the soil, the pebbles, the rocks, the gravel, the sand, the boulders would just simply drop. You can imagine that. Imagine you take an ice cube in your house and you put it on a plate, and on the top of it, you sprinkle a bit of sand, and then just sit back and watch. Where does the sand go? It goes to the bottom, and the water spreads out left, right, front, and back. This is what the glacier did. Whatever was in it was simply dropped when it melted. <clears throat> Some of the things that were dropped were truly immense. Huge boulders. Here's one. This one's in Cape Cod. Look at the size of that thing. Compare it with the car next to it. You can see what a huge thing it was. We would call that an erratic boulder. Erratic. It's not supposed to be there. Well, how did it get there? Well, nobody trucked it there. This thing must weigh hundreds and hundreds of tons, maybe thousands. The glacier dropped it on Cape Cod. As a matter of fact, it was the glacier that made Cape Cod. There was no Cape Cod before that last glacier. And all the islands out there that we go to and visit and so forth, all those islands were also deposited by the glacier, including Long Island. That's an erratic boulder. Erratic because it's not supposed to be there. 
Also on Cape Cod are cranberry bogs. Those are glacial ponds which now grow cranberries and they're all over the eastern United States, maybe here in Ohio, I don't know, I think up in Michigan, yes, there are. It's got to be the right soil, pH, or the right amount of acidity in the soil, and it's got to be very moist. But that is also a creation, after the fact, of the glacier. So that's an erratic boulder in Cape Cod. Are there erratic boulders in Ohio? Oh, you bet there are. Not that big. There's one. It's called Centennial Rock. If you go out Broadway, to my right, I think I'm right, across the river into an area of Columbus, used to be called Franklinton, and if you continue out there just about to where the police headquarters is, or I think there's a psychiatric hospital out there too, on the right as you're going west. There's a pathway you can take off into a very well-known picnic ground in the last century. And in that picnic ground is a big rock, there it is, called Centennial Rock. And it's an erratic boulder dropped there by the glacier. The very first inhabitants of Franklinton and in Columbus knew about this. They had no idea where it came from, but it was a favorite place to go for a Sunday afternoon stroll. Probably today people walk by it and don't have the foggiest notion what it is. I have another picture of it here taken, oh, about a hundred years or so ago. Where do you see this? It's from the other side of the glacier. I'm sorry, not the glacier, but the other side of the, of the rock. And there it is, and painted on it is 1797, 1897, that was the first centennial, Columbus, Franklinton Centennial. And look at the ladies standing there. Look at their dresses. All that time ago. That thing is 50 feet in circumference. And I have no idea what that thing is on the left hand side, down at the ground level. It looks like a barrel or a, a cannon sticking out. I don't know what that is. I doubt that it's there now, but you can get an idea of what this kind of granite erratic looks like, and it looks like today. It's still there. People still go down there. I think the picture of the ladies is fantastic, and I hope you ladies in the audience are enjoying their hats and their dresses and the looks on their faces. And look where their hands are, right on their hips. They look pretty tough, like a pretty tough group to me in 1897. Well, there's a centennial rock, which is an erratic. Another one, which is found in Columbus, is on the Ohio State campus. Maybe many of you have seen it. If I had you in an audience, I'd ask you to put your hands up to find out whether you'd seen it or not. That boulder, it weighs 16 tons, is a billion years old, far, far, far older than the glacier that brought it here from northern Canada. And we know exactly where it came from because it, small chips have been analyzed by the geology department and then they went to northern Canada to find the same chemical composition of granite and they found it so they know exactly where the glacier picked this thing up and trucked it on down here and dumped it here in Ohio, actually right here in Columbus, Ohio. And it was originally at the corner of 16th Street and Iuka Avenue. And I don't know where the name I-U-K-A came from, but I have a theory about it. But anyway, that general area was one in which the last Wyandotte Indian lived for many years after the Wyandotte Indians were transported out of Ohio. And he became sort of famous in his own light. And 
I wonder if the IUKA for Iuka Avenue is not an Indian Wyandot word. That's a theory. I don't know that that's true. But at any rate, when Orton Hall on the Ohio State campus was built, it was thought that it would be really great to put a glacial erratic on the front lawn of Orton Hall. And so this monstrosity, 16-ton thing, was found and was loaded into some sort of a wagon. I can't imagine what kind of a wagon or truck it would have been. And this was 1905 that this was done and somehow transported from there to the Ohio State campus and eventually stood on end the way you see it here with that slight leaning to the right. You gotta be kind of nervous about that. I don't know how much of it's underground. So with the completion of OSU's Orton Hall, which is geology, which you see in the background there, in 1905, that geologic rock was placed in that position. Kind of a clever idea, I thought. The next slide here shows it's a small view of a gravel pit, sand pit, which are all over northern United States, where today they're being mined for their gravel and their sand. And trust me, this is a valuable asset. The people who own these places, most construction can't go on without a supply of gravel and a supply of crushed stone of varying sizes. All of that comes from a glacier. And you can get some idea here of the, the mounding that the glacier did by, by the, just the height of the cliffs that are being cut through in order to mine these materials. All of that was deposited, oh, about 25,000 years ago as the glacier melted and receded. Invaluable resource today. And I heard somewhere recently that People are getting alarmed that it's getting harder and harder to find good sand and good gravel for building purposes. Remember, all roads take the same kind of thing, gravel and sand. So the demand for these materials are enormous. That's a glacial deposit. All right, let's go to Kelly's Island. I'll admit the ferry boat there is not going to Kelly's Island, but that's okay. You get on the ferry boat at Marblehead Peninsula in Marblehead. That's the one that takes you to Kelly's Island. It looks like this. And we'll take you over with your car or without your car. Actually, you can go to Kelly's Island and not need a car. You can walk around Kelly's Island pretty easily. Uh, it's just a couple of miles around and, and just idyllic. It's quiet. Unlike Put-in Bay, which many of you may remember, is pretty wild. Kelly's Island is really idyllic. It's quiet and peaceful and a beautiful place to picnic and maybe go to the beach. And this is the way you get there. And other than an airplane, it's the only way you get there. Here's an aerial view of Kelly's Island and the yellow arrow on your upper left side is the ferry dock. That's the only one. That's where you end up right there. And you're virtually downtown in, on Kelly's Island at that point. You'll notice on the right hand side down towards the bottom of the picture is Long Point. Well that's certainly well named isn't it? You can see Long Point there. Today Long Point is almost entirely a nature preserve. You can see the airport there. It really has a single runway and then connecting connectors to the hangars. And finally, in the upper right corner in the red are where the glacial grooves are. Grooves in the bedrock, sand, limestone bedrock of Kelly's Island. Remember now, this is the limestone that underlies all of Ohio. So that's the island, and it gives you an idea where the glacial grooves are.
By the way, Kelly's Island is in Erie County, I believe. This next slide shows the beach at Kelly's Island on the north side. And you can see Long Point in the middle of the picture going off to the left. It's not a big island. You can walk around it. I think it's around approximately 12 miles to walk around its perimeter. Um, it's only a, a mile or mile and a half across the island. So it's not a large island at all. <clears throat> and then the great attraction. I mean, what is Kelly's Island famous for? Well, in the past, and I'm talking back in the 19th century, they raised grapes, and at one time, the largest winery in the world. It burned down, I think, in about 1915 or 1960, but the ruins are still there. You can see the ruins of that winery. Today, it's just a peaceful place to go and swim or have a picnic and go to a quiet place to have a drink in town and go to see the world famous glacial grooves. Glacial grooves that were caused as the glacier ran into what would one day be Kelly's Island, which at that time was probably just a hill, and carved out in the bedrock, in the limestone bedrock, grooves of unimaginable size as that glacier scraped along with all of its debris. And I can show you those here. Here are the grooves. The limestone you're seeing there, that's all limestone. That's Devonian limestone, which is exceedingly ancient, millions and millions of years old. It underlies all of Ohio and Indiana and other places. And when you look at it, you see the fossils of ancient marine critter, critters. This was an inland arm of the ocean. And so there are lots of fossils of shellfish and various other organisms that lived all those millions of years ago. And if you look at the top there, you can see some pictures of men, and I think there's a lady up there, about in the middle of the picture. Just to give you an idea of size, you can compare. And then farther down as you look, way down you can see more people on the left. And at the far end of the picture, there's a, looks like a walk bridge. And there is a way to go from one side to the other. And there are some people on the walk bridge. That gives you some concept of the size of this thing. But those grooves carved into the limestone underbasement rock were caused by the movement of the glacier, dragging along huge granite boulders, the kind you've seen in previous slides, which gouged out and polished these grooves. And geologists just love them. And why did they love them? Well, for one thing, it showed the glacier was there. But even more important, if you take a hand compass and put it down there, guess what? You know which direction the glacier was moving. And not only that, there are grooves all over glaciated Ohio. Not like this. This is really stupendous. These are the greatest grooves in the world. But there are other striations, other islands on the mainland here in Ohio that tell you which way the glacier was going and where did it turn. And, for you, and knowing that and looking around, you can make a guess as to why it turned. So there's a lot of geology uh, in, in these grooves. It's all Devonian limestone. And I think this may be my last picture. And I've said essentially these things before that they're the largest grooves in the world. That there are no picture, there are no people in this picture. I notice, um, no, and deposited that limestone was deposited probably three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand years ago, whereas the glacier went cruising through there about twenty thousand years ago. There's a big difference in time on this. And it's interesting to notice that in the early years, in the 19th century, that people were mining, quarrying limestone 
off Kelly's Island, and there were actually more of these grooves which have all been destroyed and sent out as building materials to build banks and churches and other institutions, large businesses, all across the United States, all coming from Kelly Island limestone. When it was discovered what the grooves were, that activity was stopped. And so we are left today with a sizable remnant of these grooves. This is, I think, is the last picture, another section of the grooves. I, I, my guess would be you could spend a lifetime studying the geology of these grooves, how they were, how they were carved, what kind of rocks went through there to do this. Are there any remnant pieces of those sorts of rocks. You see one groove here on the left is holding rainwater. And this is one of the big reasons folks go to Kelly's Island to see this. It's a, it's a state park. You can't walk on those things. You can't touch them. You can stand around and look, and there are all kinds of ways to look. There are lots of viewing up above, looking down, and in this view here, and the camera right there to take that picture. And I think that brings us to our end of glaciation in Ohio. You can see it has many, many aspects to think about. And I've covered many of these, and I'm afraid that it went very fast. And, but if you were a student in college and you were taking a course in geology, which I would highly recommend for anybody who's a non-science major, because you get so much enjoyment out of it. It's a lifelong in enjoyment because it changes everything about what you see and how you interpret what you see as you drive along through the countryside. So it's my pleasure to do this and have a nice day.